Hello, and welcome to Songwriters Spotlight, the Western Mass Songwriters Collaborative Series. I'm Dr. Dan, your host of the show, where we feature Western Mass songwriters who perform their original songs and talk about the art of songwriting. Stay tuned to explore more about music and the tunesmithing that creates it. Our performer on this episode is Peter Nelson, a graduate of St. Olaf College of Minnesota and a Norwegian-American. He earned an MFA in poetry from the widely renowned Iowa Writers Workshop and has published 30 books and 150 articles and short stories. He's a longtime resident of the Pioneer Valley, a member of the East Hampton Cultural Council, and a possible distant relative of Prince. Please stay tuned to listen to his songs and his insights from his writing and songwriting workshops. This goes out to Kate O'Connor. It's called My Last Drunk Relationship. My last drunk relationship was mutually destructive, emotionally compromised, morally corrupted. But we laughed and sang and danced and drank ourselves under the table where we rolled around and made love in so far as we were able we were the best that we could do we were all each other had we were young and we were stupid we were lonely we were sad louise My last drunk relationship had a predetermined ending. We were lost, going nowhere, but at least we weren't pretending. It was doomed and it was hopeless, a losing proposition, and an awful lot to ask of someone in our condition. We were holier than no one. Who were we to judge when she looked into my eyes? Felt a lot like love, Louise. Louise. My last drunk relationship expired as expected. At a time and in a fashion More or less predicted Somewhere in Pennsylvania with me Driving away crying And I do not miss the drama Or the BS or the lying And the memories are painful But I'm grateful that I got them If it was not for Louise I might never have touched bottom weeds. Oh, Louise. Now I don't know where she went, but I hope that she got sober, and I hope she found a husband, or at least a gentle lover and I can't say that I often ever really think about her she's better off without me and I'm better off without her but I wonder what would happen if we met again tomorrow and we saw each other clearly would there be a sense of sorrow my last drunk relationship was healing and forgiving, but I would not recommend it as a way to go on living, Louise. Oh,
Uh, this is a song called Why We Are Here. Uh, mentions a truck stop, and that would be the Waitley Diner. I was minding my own business, chewing on a grilled cheese sandwich in a Massachusetts truck stop having lunch. It was early in December. The lot was full of semis bringing Christmas trees from Canada to us. The driver sitting next to me was waiting for a friend, drinking coffee, listening to those truck stop sounds. When his friend arrived, the waitress took their orders. Both of them were at least 300 pounds. And I didn't mean to eavesdrop, though I really couldn't help it. They were talking about stuffed truck drivers, no. Then the one said he had cancer that he was starting chemo it scared him cause he was all alone the second one just listened then he reached across the table and he took his friend's hands in his and their hands were big and meaty but neither one of them let go and it struck me just how beautiful this was first one pretended that he wasn't worried he allowed it probably wouldn't be much fun the second one said tell you what i'll go on a diet that way you won't be the only skinny one and i thought of them that christmas glad to know they had each other on a winter's eve upon a midnight clear i saw the spirit of the season in a truck stop by the highway it helps me to remember why we're here why we're here yeah this is a song i wrote uh i'll explain how i wrote it later it's a song called petunia <laughs> In the casino, the stage crew is setting up rings where the circus will go. Out in the parking lot, elephants wait, knowing things only elephants know. None of the workers is all that excited. They've all seen the circus before. One of the dealers goes out for a cigarette break, standing by the back door. Do you come here often, he says to an elephant. I think I've seen you around. They call me Petunia. The elephant tells him my real name's too hard to pronounce. So what's it like traveling around with the circus? She tells him it's not what you think. If you want me to tell you the rest of my story, you'll have to buy me a drink. They find a booth in the bar by the slots where they order a pitcher of beer. And the gamblers are so busy nobody notices there's an elephant here. Circus life sucks, she says. It's demeaning. The food at its best is okay. Night after night, it's the same dog and pony show. It isn't like back in the day when no one had ever laid eyes on an elephant. We were a rarity then. And given how they're killing us for our ivory, looks like we'll be that again. Tell me about it. The Wampanoag says to her, same thing happened to us. Sometimes I look at these losers and I wonder how it was that they came out on top. You guys should build a casino, he says to her. It's like a dream come true. They travel for miles just to give us their money. They think that it's fun when they do. Really? Petunia says, really? She says again, can't you do better than this? There must be something that gives your life meaning. This can't be all that there is. Look 
look at who's talking. He says with a smile, Petunia just stares at her beer. He lays two $10 bills on the table and says, come on, let's get out of here. We're running away from the circus. He tells her we're running away from the res. One fewer elephant, one fewer Indian. Who's going to miss us? He says. And then the, the companion, the, the companion song to that, because that's about a circus. This is about a magician. And it's called the, uh, the Ballad of Houdini's Mother. Back in the days of great magic, as the streetcars of Budapest rolled by, Houdini's mother was pregnant. She said, husband, I think that it's time. The nurses wore fishnet and sequins. The doctors in top hats and tails. They asked for a moment of silence. Houdini's mother looked pale. As she hung in the air, levitated. They passed hoops over her to prove the crowd in the operating theater that what they were saying was true. The calliope played over the waves as Mother Houdini bore down in a feat of epic proportion. Never before seen in this town until the doctors with style and flourish in a feat of remarkable magic. Produced from between her two legs, a seven pound bouncing white rabbit. As the hospital gasped and fell silent, the mystery hung in the gloom until a baby was heard to cry from a chest in the back of the room. So Houdini arrived in this world to astonish, amuse, and amaze. The same way that love comes to find us in all its mysterious ways. So the last song is a uh, a song. It's a true story. It's it's a true story that I'm not quite telling the truth when I tell the true story because, uh, well, I'll, I'll explain that later. But uh, I used to work at a bar in in Iowa City called the Mill, and it was when I say it's a biker bar, the bikers uh, rode BMW motorcycles. It was it wasn't like a Harley bar, but uh, and there was a kid who played on uh, Friday nights uh, named Greg Brown. He was like the local folk singer, and, and people didn't realize how good he well, Some did. So people would just eat their dinner while he was playing, and I was up front. And I started writing songs after hours. When working at that bar, we'd grab some beer, and we'd go to somebody's house and play music, and I, I didn't have anything to contribute, so I, I was writing songs. And this is about something that happened one night at that bar. I used to work as a bartender. I poured mostly shots and beers. 
for bikers and poets, guys in between careers. But it was the kind of place where people came to relax and have some fun. There was a sense of community there. It was sort of like a church where you get drunk. And I took care of my waitresses. I considered them my friends. I made a killer margarita, especially for them. So one night, a waitress named Danielle showed up late for work. She was living with her boyfriend. He was known to be a jerk. And she was wearing sunglasses. She said she'd walked into a door. But the truth of the matter was, this had happened a couple of times before. She said, so help her, God, this time would be the last. All she wanted was for him to leave, but she was too afraid to ask. We said, he's not going to touch you. He's not even going to call. He's not going to do anything at all because he's leaving town and he's leaving today he's not gonna hurt you he's going away we got four big old burly bikers two poets and me we formed a corporation and we called ourselves Danielle's Moving Company. We went out to her house. She lived out in the burbs. By the time that he came home from work that night, all his stuff was sitting on the curb. He said, why don't you mind your own business? Me and Dee Dee are in love. And we said, you know, that really doesn't matter now that push has come to shove. We bought out all his belongings. And we paid him 50 bucks. We let him keep his guitar, his Kawasaki, and his truck. As he surrendered his house keys, he used profanity and swore. There was a brief misunderstanding, and then he walked into a door three times. We said, you're not going to touch her. You're not even going to call. You're not going to do anything at all. Because you're leaving town, and you're leaving today. You're not going to hurt her, you're going away. We heard he's doing time in Tucson, DUI and credit theft. We had to take up a collection just to pay the phone bill that he left. And Danielle, well, she's dating an attorney, and she's as happy as she can be dating an attorney, but she knows if she ever needs us, she can always reach us at Danielle's Moving Company. You're not going to touch her. You're not even going to call. You're not going to do anything at all. Because you're leaving town and you're leaving today. You're not going to hurt her. You're going away. Um, a great collection of songs. I, I, all of them delightful. Thank you. And I felt like I'd heard them all the first time, although I've heard them all 20 times at least. Very enjoyable, thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah. So how long have you been writing songs? Well, if you count the songs I wrote about my sister when I, when I was 10 years old, <laughs> which were mean, 
Um, we had a band called the Astronauts in, in when we were little kids. But seriously, I, I started writing songs um, as a bartender in Iowa City. And uh, I would write on a cocktail napkin, and I would write parodies, uh, like ghost, ghost writers in disguise, or mamas don't let your babies pretend to be cowboys. And, you know, and, and I did that because we had after-hour parties. And there was a local kid who played Friday night. His name was Greg Brown. And uh, he would play, and I would sit up front and listen while people were eating their dinner and kind of not paying attention. But he was, I was in the Iowa Writers Workshop at the time, and I was getting an MFA in poetry. And I was studying poetry, and I was seeing him do in song what my compatriots were trying to do in, in their poems. And song lyrics is not poetry. I make that distinction. But he was creating stories, creating images, conveying meaning. Um, and it was, you know, as you know, he's like the biggest folk singer one of them that we have right now. Um, and so I was writing songs to have something to play because we, we'd grab a quart of uh, Paps Blue Ribbon and the, the growlers, you know, we'd mm -hmm. grab those and, and we'd go to somebody's house after hours and play in music in somebody's kitchen. We'd play till the sun came up and have fun. So I didn't have anything to, I didn't have anything to, to contribute to those parties. So that was what first got me started. And then, then after I left Iowa City, Somewhere along the line, I started to try to write like real songs. So I was probably 20, 28 or 29, something like that, when I first really, really started trying, mm -hmm. which was struck me as surprising because before that, I would have said, I don't know how people can write. It didn't. I didn't know how people could write a song, and then I, then I did. It, it was a mystery to me. I don't know. You know, I, I could write stories, I could write poems, mm -hmm. but I just didn't know how to write a real song. You know, but I taught myself, I guess. Mm -hmm. How many have you written? Well, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I'm not going to count the first 200 because <laughs> they're. I don't. I don't know that I've kept any of. I've probably about a thousand. I, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere within a couple hundred of a thousand, but. There's a lot of songs that I don't finish, and a lot of songs that I that I used to love that I realize weren't very good. And I have I have a, a file in my computer, and I can look up these words with no recollection of what the melody might have ever been, and and no desire to find it again. You know, so they're like in the past. But mm -hmm. uh, so maybe a thousand. Why do you write them? Well, I write them. To, for one thing, to get them out of my head, <laughs> you know, because otherwise, it, it, it said like, why think of a song and not write it down? Why, why have a song and not play it for somebody else? I'm not doing this for me. Uh, if I was building chairs, and you said, why do you build chairs? I would say, I, I build chairs so people can sit. I, I don't build chairs to fill my house with chairs. I write songs for people to hear them because songs can help you get through difficult times that can help you. Um, when my, my cousin Barbara died in high school, I was, a, I was 17, she was 16. And uh, the day my father, she was walking home from a football game and no one, they couldn't see her in the headlights and so she got hit. So Saturday morning my dad woke me up and uh, you know, all of a sudden I was never gonna see her again. And I walked around the lake near my house, and I sang uh, uh, Fire and Rain. And that song helped me, got me through. And, and so why do I write songs? It's to help other people if I can. And it's fun, and I enjoy playing and singing and all that. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, you're, it's asking me why to write a song. is kind of like asking me why is there art. Mm -hmm. Well, we know, we know what it's for. And, and, if you, and if you think of it, you better write it down. So I guess that's the best answer to that. Uh, the songs that you just performed, uh, are some more helpful than others? Or? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I, I was uh, at a seminar once. Um, 
I lived in Providence, Rhode Island. I lived near Brown, and I had friends in the graduate English department at Brown. And John Updike came to give a talk, and, and I wasn't a student there, but I was friends, of, you know, they invited me. So I, I was at um, this seminar, and I had been working on a novel, I write novels, and I'd been working on a novel in which I was struggling with the, the character of the, the father, the main character's father. And I was worried about um, pissing my father, my own father off. You know, I, I didn't want to like get in trouble with my, my family. And uh, I asked Updike this question because I, I, I knew his, his son David's roommate at Harvard was a friend of mine. And, and he said David Updike didn't particularly care for the way John Updike wrote about his family. And so I asked Updike, how do you write about your family? And he said, uh, he said to, a, to a writer, shame to a writer is what cowardice is to a soldier. You cannot allow it to enter into the process. And he said, he said, uh, you can, there's the story you tell your friends and the story you tell yourself and the story you're afraid to tell yourself. And you better be working on the story you're afraid to tell yourself. Because everybody else gets to, gets to skip it. Every, no one else has to go to those scary places and talk about it in public. But if you do that, then the art that you make starts to have value to other people because they can see their own inner thoughts that they're kind of afraid to voice. And there it is in front of you. The song about my last drunk relationship um, was actually, you know, Louise, her, that's not her real name. Her real name, she only had one syllable. I needed two, so I had, I had to change it. But it's a song about being an alcoholic, you know, and, and most alcoholics, which I am, you know, and most alcoholics, uh, they, they call it Alcoholics Anonymous for a reason, you know, and they don't want to talk about it. So that song talks about it, and that song might help somebody who's going through uh, the process of quitting or thinking about it. Um, that song help, helps people. Uh, I think the Houdini song helps people understand that love can come when you least expect it, and it's a surprise and it's magic and it, it's it's hiding out there somewhere. But don't give up on it because it, it could find you at any minute. You know. So I think I try to help people. Some songs are just for fun, but mm -hmm. um, the Danielle's Moving Company song uh, that that's. A true story that isn't quite true because I was bartending that night, so I saw I saw Danielle come in. It's not a real name, but she, the, she came in with her with her black eye, and I saw the guys go off to her house to move her boyfriend out, and I heard the story when they came back to the bar, mm -hmm. and beers were shared all around. But you know they'd gotten rid of this guy, and and uh, you know that's a song which is. A little weird because it's both for and against violence, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, in a sense. It's, it's like the proper use of force and, and it's what men can do that's a good thing to help women in trouble like that. Um, you know, yeah, I think they're all about being helpful. Mm -hmm. So when you put together a song, uh, what, is there a standard way that you do it or is does it vary from one song to the next? It, it varies from one song. You know, uh, I've, I've said before, you, you can't say what comes first, the words or the music. It's mm -hmm. like asking your mother what came first, the sperm or the egg. You know, things, things collide. Um, I, I'll hear a line. I, uh, I was seeing a, a performer in Shelburne last weekend who said, between songs, he said, well, man, I'm always the last to know. And I, and I just went, oh, well, that is the hook to a song. I, I haven't finished it yet, but you know, I'm always the last to know. Uh, a lot of times I'll just, I'll just think, of a, you know, think of a song and, and, and think of where it's going to go. I write songs about people I know who I love and maybe they're in trouble and I want to help them. Or um, the, the, song, uh, Dan, uh, the song about Petunia, the elephant. Um, happened when I was teaching songwriting at a place called the Isabella Friedman 
Jewish Retreat Center in Northwest Connecticut. And I'd been invited to teach us a little seminar on songwriting. And there was this woman there who was very, um, very abstract or spiritual or hard to pin down, hard, hard to get to focus. Um, and she wanted to write a song about elephants and Indians. And I said, well, just make up a story where an elephant and an Indian meet. And she said, oh, you can't do that. And I thought, I just did that. And, and uh, honestly, the whole, not, not, the, not the way to tell the story, but uh, the whole story instantly almost appeared, you know, okay, they get together, they talk, they, they leave together. You know, they, they, they rescue each other. Um, and, and so I, I feel a little guilty, like I stole a song from someone. You know, she, she, had her, <laughs> she had her millisecond to write it, but I got there first. <laughs> um, but, but the thing about story songs, ballads, uh, is the, you know, I, I teach writing and I've written books and I've written short stories and, and I've spent my life thinking and learning about how to tell a story. And uh, stories have to start, and I think good ballads or good songs have to start, with a sense that somebody's in trouble. The singer or the subject the singer's singing about, but somebody's in trouble at the beginning of a story. And when you have that, you have a song that starts, help, you know, or uh, you have a song where the, 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 you, you, the very first line of the song, I have a song about a, a girl who got pregnant in high school. It said, when I was 15 and a man of the world. And you know right away, no one's 15. No one's a man of the world at 15. This character is going to learn something they need to learn. Um, if you start with somebody in trouble, people... They've, they've measured people's brains. And, and they, someone says, uh, uh, the river is overflowing. And you get a shot of cortisol in your brain. And that's the, the threat response. You, oh, no, trouble, danger, uh-oh. And then your attention is held. Um, and then, then you realize it's not you. You're not the one in trouble. Someone else is in trouble. But we care about each other. We're, we live in societies, we don't live alone. And we aggregate and we, we need each other. And so we get a dose of oxytocin, which is the, the what is it, the, uh, the hormone of empathy. We empathize with the character. And we wanna know what happens to that character. We, we're gonna listen to the song until we find out what happened to Danielle. She showed up with a black eye. Is she okay? You know? And it's the, so, you know, that, the hook isn't quite set at the, at the first line of that song, but uh, in the casino, the stage goes setting up rings where the circus will go out in the parking lot, elephants wait. You go, uh-oh, elephants? I love elephants. Are they okay? You know, you have a sense something bad might happen to the elephant. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you, when you get, the, get the listener involved empathetically, Two things. One, you care about the fictitious, the, the person in the song. And two, you want to learn what's going to happen to you, if, what you should do if that happens to you. you you're, you're worried about yourself and you care about someone else. You're altruistic and you're, and altruistic and you're selfish. And you listen to the song to find out what the story means. And the stories we remember, the songs we remember, are the, the, it's called literary Darwinism. And I believe this wholeheartedly. You remember the stories that help you survive, adapt. You, the, the stories survive if they help you survive. And if they don't help you, you don't remember them. You, know, you, you remember them for a little while. But you, know, you remember that story that helped you. Oh, remember that story about the, the, the girl who had the black eye? Oh, yeah, yeah. If that happens, you can get some of your friends to help. They can go to your house for you and move. You know, you remember stuff that is going to be important to you later. You sit up because you think this could be important, and you listen. You think, that is important. I'll remember that. And the other thing, um, you remember stories that are told in the in the concrete, not the abstract. Um, you use concrete language to create an image, uh, T.S. Eliot called it the objective correlative. Remember that from college English or high school? 
That means the object that correlates with the thing, mm -hmm. with the feeling, with the emotion. The object that correlates with love arriving unexpected is a, is a white rabbit and a baby crying in the chest in the back of the room. Those, you know, everybody knows what a white rabbit is. Everybody knows what a chest is. That, you know, that song, you picture a room full of people and the calliope plays over the waves. You can hear the song. You're, you, you're not like confused. I hopefully have never written anything in a song that's confusing. I don't know songs I love that have anything confusing in them. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of people with open mics sing songs with images that are confusing to me. And I don't really struggle with them. I don't, I'm not, I don't have time to stress about what that meant. I just think, well, that didn't work. I don't understand what you just said. Hopefully everything I said, I say is, is clear and you, you're not confused and you have a concrete image of a, of a group of bikers in a, in a bar or a man in a truck stop. That song um, uh, was, was uh, just, just pretty much fell in my lap. I, I didn't really have to invent anything for that song. What, no, you, you heard it, what, 20 minutes ago. What do you remember about it? Two big, bike, uh, two big truckers sitting yeah. at a table and, and sharing the fact that one of them has cancer, How do you, holding what, what, hands. Holding hands, yeah. right? And, that, you know, and th that's just what happened. I was sitting this far away from them. I was in the corner booth and they were at the next table at the Whitley Diner. And, and, uh, and I saw this guy reach over and, 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 you know, big old greasy, should have washed them hands, you know. But the, he kept holding on to them because this guy was scared. And, and uh, you can see that song. Yeah. You know, and, and you can, and it, it starts off, you know, why am I mentioning a grilled cheese sandwich? Well, for one thing, that's what I was eating, but, you know, now the, people go, oh, that's the song where the grilled cheese sandwich guy. Mm -hmm. I remember that song with the grilled cheese sandwich in it. If that wasn't there, it would be harder to remember the song. And, and in my way of thinking, uh, if a song is, if you can remember the, what the song was about five minutes after you heard it, it works. If, and, and there's a lot of times you'll be, at, you'll be here you know, at open mic or something, and you hear a song and you're like, I don't really know what I just heard. I can't remember right now. What was that song about? And, and love, you know, but what did it, you know, it's hard to remember stuff. You can't remember abstractions. You can remember concrete things. Mm -hmm. So if you use concrete things, people will remember the song. Well, why we are here about the truck stop, you take it from a sandwich to why we are here. Right. Yeah. And suddenly it gets, you know, that's what happened. You know, I was just, I was literally, you know, minding my own business. And, and all of a sudden, I, cancer, chemo, what? You know? Um, and the uh, one thing I've, I've taught when I teach writing and one thing I've learned, uh, there was an Irish short story writer named Frank O'Hara. And he said, uh, there's only two subjects that songs are about. One is, I was never the same again. And the other is, we are all brothers. And that song is about being brothers. Being, that's why we're here, to, to help each mm -hmm. other out. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of implied that, that the, the, the listener, the singer, was not, was, his life was changed by that event. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you write about, um, Arthur Miller said, a, a play happens on the most important day in a character's life. Well, why would a day be important? Because it's the day your life changed. It's the mm -hmm. day everything turned around or everything sank. You know, good or bad, some, some turning pivotal, pivotal point happened there. And I have a song about, you know, I didn't do it, but like, what was the most important day in my life? Oh, I can think of the worst day in my life, and I wrote about that. You know, I, I try to apply these things that I use when I teach writing in, mm -hmm. in my own work. And, and you know, that song, um, the, the elephant and the Indian running off, that's, we are all brothers. We're, we're, we're in this together. Let's help each other out. Let's, let's get out of here. So I, I try to apply the things that I, that I use when I teach. Yeah. So a story you're afraid to tell yourself, what does that mean exactly? Well, it means uh, things that you're ashamed of, things you're embarrassed by, things you, mistakes you made. Um, I have a, 
I could, I could do several hours of, of songs and never repeat myself singing about relationships that failed, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and, you know, more than one, it's not like I have that many failed relationships. I have like six failed relationships and, and 500 songs. Um, it, it's, 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 it's trying to find the thing that makes you different from everybody else. If, if you go to the, you know, I, I, I tell people, different people have different levels of skill and, and musicianship and, and articulation. You know, people have various amounts of talent, but everybody has the same size soul. I, don't, I believe that. I don't think, um, I think, I think we are equal in some internal essential part of ourselves and and that soul means the things that that messed you up that 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 uh you know i had a i had a, a my cousin in when i was a freshman in college my cousin was a sophomore and he came up knocked on my door and said you want to get stoned um in 1972 uh, and I said, sure. And he had this joint that, that um, he found. <laughs> you know, don't, never smoke something you found. But he found it at a party. And we went out <laughs> and smoked it. And it had uh, angel dust in it, we, I think. Uh, mm. I, I don't know. Um, but it, it messed me up. And it developed, I developed a couple of phobias from that. And, and that's like, if, if you ask me, what's the worst thing that ever happened to me? I would say that, that's it. Mm. Certainly one of them. But that makes me different from everybody else. That 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 has changed the way I see things. It changed. The, it it it's it's taught me how to how to overcome a phobia. I don't have them anymore. I was afraid of hiccuping to death. You know, because you hiccup. Like you hear those stories about people that hiccup for fifty years. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'd get the hiccups. I go, oh no, I'm gonna I'm gonna be one of those guys that hiccups forever. Um, that wasn't that wasn't the most serious of the of the things, but you know. So so this the what makes you what damages you and flaw and makes you flawed is what you recover from, and what you recover from gives you something valuable to say to other people who might not know how to recover from that. And and uh, the, so really the you know the if you ask me would I undo that if, if if I could go back in time and and my cousin knocked on the door would I say no thanks. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, because it, it made me me, you know, and it, yeah. it messed me up for 10 years, but it made me different and, and unique and gave me something to say, so. Mm -hmm. So you, you do workshops and you study processes and, and concepts about songwriting. Um, are there other things that you would suggest to people who want to write good songs? What, what are the kinds of things should they think about? Well. Uh, they should certainly, you host it, was it Country Blues and Bluegrass? Yes. So you, you went into the history of, of music in, yeah. in, in one part of it. And maybe, you know, what I was going to say is you should listen as broadly and as widely as possible. Yeah. Listen to Bluegrass, listen to the Carter family, but listen to Fats Waller, listen to Duke Ellington, listen to uh, jazz, listen to gospel, listen to rap. Which I don't much care for, but I, I listen to it to try to see what's going on here. You know, because mm -hmm. um, there's no bad music; it's all it's all something special. You know, uh, you know, and, and I and you do see people that, that don't seem to have done much of their homework. They they, they write songs without without um, researching the thing that they want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I grew up in a household with. Um, we had a, a box set of classical records, which would probably what that be like twelve, yeah. you know. And one side was Mendelssohn, and one side was Haydn, and you know. And I and I, I wore those out. Mm. I had my my parents had um, Anita Bryant, and Anita Bryant whole he's got the whole world in his hands. They had a Mahalia Jackson record. Mm. They had a guy. I think his name was Tom Evans. Do you remember the song Seven Little Girls? No. This is one of the first songs that I went, seven little girls, 
sitting in the back seat, kissing and hugging with Fred. Oh, they said, why don't you come on and see my triple carburetor? And this is what the little girls said all together now. One, two, three. Keep your mind on your driving. Keep your hands on the wheel. Keep your beady eyes on the road ahead. We're having fun sitting in the back seat, kissing and hugging with Fred. So I learned that like when I was four, something like that. <laughs> um, it's a really creepy video if you ever want to Google that, because oh. it's with puppets. You know, so. <laughs> um, and, then I, and then my parents had uh, 45s. Uh, I, I loved Minnie the Moocher. I was, you know, four years old going Heidi, Heidi, Heidi Ho. Uh, Tommy Dorsey, uh, I loved Obviously, the Beatles, you know, when they hit, nothing more important in my world. But at the same time, as, as people of our generation will remember, there were these things on TV called variety shows. Yeah. And they had the guy in the tuxedo who was uh, Jack Jones or Vic Damone or Steve Lawrence or Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra or, or Nat King Cole. And, and, you know, I watched them, and, and I thought, you know, well, the Beatles are my kind of music, and this is my parents' kind of music. But I like, you know, I realized I like them as much, you know, and I write, mm -hmm. I've written songs that I like those songs. You know, I, you know I'll, I'll start, you know, you noodle around on the guitar, and you play a, a jazz chord, you know, like a, a major nine or something like that. You go, oh, that's where this song's going. Let's see where, let's see where, it, where it ends. Mm -hmm. And end up writing the, you know, kind of Frank Sinatra songs. So, so I think you know it would help people to uh, just dig deep into the into the history of music. I think a mistake you know a lot of people make now. It's, it's really easy to record on your iPad. I do that myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in a I was at a conference once, and, and somebody said a music conference. And I heard somebody in the elevator say, "I've written seven songs. I just have to write three more, and I can make a CD." And I thought. You're going to record the first 10 songs you ever wrote. You're going to record those and put those out into the world. And all you've done is written 10 songs. Really? You know, and people get so excited. And it's, it's possible with home recording technology that you can do that. But I think, you know, I, I, I had two CDs from Signature Sounds. And that happened when Jim Olson uh, wanted to start a music company, and, and I had a, a group that met in my office. I have an office downtown Northampton, and it was a songwriting group, and we give, give ourselves prompts. And uh, Dar Williams was one of the people in that group. Mm -hmm. uh, Erica Wheeler, Bernice Lewis, Adam Rothberg, uh, Lynn Saner, Janet Feld. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing. It was kind of a rotating group, but we'd meet and we'd, we'd sing songs. Um, and you know, so we'd, we'd kind of practice writing songs, but the idea, like, recording your first 10 songs, um, it's kind of scary that people would, would, would want to do that. But, we, you know, we, we were just writing, um, we'd pull, pull prompts out of a hat. Uh, you know, I had a song that says, I had, you had pulled a, a person, a place, and an action. So I had to do a, a somebody, somebody juggling oranges at a YMCA. And I actually have a song that was pretty good about juggling oranges at the YMCA. Um, I think I've forgotten what the question was, but um, we're, we're fine. <laughs> we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, how much uh, revision uh, editing do you do with your songs? It it varies. Um, there there's sometimes I'll I'll write lyrics and throw them away, and and write a whole different set. Um, I t you know. I think I, I think I'm personally would, I would rather write a new song than fix an old one. I would rather like like throw out throw away an old one that I don't like and 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 move on to the next thing right, rather than sit and struggle um, with something that, that if it, was it Hank Williams who said uh, you should be able to write a good song in two minutes. Yeah, yeah. I think he said that, and I kind of know what that means. You mm -hmm. know, like the, the 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 good ones really come out pretty good right away. Um, I, I wrote, uh, uh, sometimes I'll write songs, Cheryl Wheeler would write a song and she'd, she'd pick, call her, her, her uh, answering f uh, machine at home and she would sing a line and 
and record that. In, and then when she got home, she'd have 55 messages, all 10 seconds long. You know, so she had re had written the song while she's driving in the car. And and I'll, I'll you know, so if some if something comes up like that, you know, I'll, I'll write a frag a fragment, and then I, you know, I'll, I, I write. I have you know my iPad or something wherever I am, you know, all day long, I can, I can write down a note if, if something occurs to me. Mm -hmm. So, so not a whole lot of revising, you know, I mean, um, I mean, I'll take a song if, 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 if I, I'll take a song in a major key and change it to a minor key. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that ends up being two songs, you know, the exact same chords in the exact same order, but with, with, with changing from major to minor. Uh, I'll take a song and, and make it three four time instead of four four time. I'll, you know, if something if if I, I'll just say maybe this is the right way to do it. Um, so you, you know, that's not exactly revising; it's just kind of revisioning. You know, try, trying to think okay. of what's a, what's a different way to see this. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, written songs with other people, and that that tends to be a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, of course, there's writing and then there's performing. Yeah, and you gave us five great examples of both and because you know a well-written song if it's not performed well is just kind of out there what yeah what what do you see as key to making it do a, a good performance of a song well one thing and the reason I know you is because at the open mic at um, Luthier's on Wednesday nights is a chance to practice in front of people and I, I found earlier that no matter how many times you play something at home, it doesn't matter because it's not playing in front of people. And you can't, the only way to practice playing in front of people is pl play in front of people, you know, and mm -hmm. go, to, go to open mics. Um, but really. I, I play open mics to, to make sure I um, feel, com just feeling comfortable in, in front of people. And everyone at Luthier's is a friend now. I, I, mm -hmm. Very unusual when there's somebody there. I don't. Well, you know, actually, every night there's probably what we say thirty people, and maybe five I don't know, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, learning to to put your mouth. You know, it's good to have a mustache because you can make your you can feel it when you're touching the microphone. <laughs> um, although now with coronavirus, I should probably like stay back, but. Um, you know, get on the mic, make eye contact with people. Um, my, my, I remember my first public performance. I, I was invited in. I was in college, and the friend, a friend of mine had a, um, a a visiting a friend visiting who was good at the banjo, and he wanted a guitar to help him play at like college open mic. And it was it was a foggy mountain breakdown or. Mm. Foggy Mountain, whatever that, you know the song. Yeah, yeah. Foggy Mountain. Baby. And so I learned the guitar part, and then I got up on, on the stage, with, and the stage was a, a, ta a table in the dining room, dining hall, just the tables that you eat on, you know, so mm -hmm. that's how wide is that. And there was a mic stand and a chair, and, and I got on the, I got on the, um, it was kind of hard to, you know, get up there without falling or tipping anything off, and, and I, and I, I brought my guitar up and I smoked cigarettes and my cigarettes, I brought it up and, and the guitar hit my, my pack of cigarettes and knocked the cigarettes onto the edge of the table. And so I, I leaned over to pick them up and I hit the mic stand which fell off the table into the audience and, and everything, you know, and I got, I got a big laugh because people thought I was doing this on purpose. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so stage, stagecraft. I once had a. Uh, I was opening for Laurie McKenna on Cape Cod, and I had a song. And I had I had sung this a million times, but I I, I forgot the words. And the, if that happens to you, the next time you play it, you go, "Oh, this is the song I forget the words to." And and at that point, you forget the. You know, you go up on your line. And so I had I had written cues to this song. Uh, on a piece of white typing paper with a red sharpie, and I, I was playing it on the piano, and uh, and I I got the paper out and I talked, to, I introduced the song, and then I looked at the page and it was blank because the stage lights were red, <laughs> and the lettering was red, so it was it was invisible, and, and I, I I'm like oh my god, um, so 
you know, you learn by doing, you know, you learn by, yeah. um, but, you know, and, and playing often, that like, a, you know, you just, you learn to just feel comfortable. And, you know, I, I've seen people that kind of tell, they don't just tell the same story for every song, but they, they give the same introduction word for word. Mm. And I don't, um, you know, I, I, I'll think like, tell the magician story, you know, before I tell, before I sing the Houdini song, I have a, I have two different introductions to that song. Do you want to hear one? Yeah. We got time? Uh, you know, cause, cause I think, you know, one or the other, maybe even both, you know, um, uh, doing a, doing a solo show. Sometimes you have a, you know, I, I sometimes talk more than I play, which might not be the right thing to do. I don't know. Um, but the, 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 the Houdini song, uh, sometimes I introduce it by saying, I, I ask people, can you remember where you were on February 9th, 1964? Can you remember where you were? February 9th, Sunday night, 1964. Oh, uh, watching the Beatles. Watching the Beatles. And I introduced the song and said, can anyone remember who followed the Beatles? It was a magician named Fred Capps. He was from, he was Dutch and he, he I'm sure thought it was his big break. You know, everyone's gonna remember me. I'm gonna be on the Ed Sullivan show. Um, but, but, so like I'll, that's one way to introduce that song. My favorite way is, is to t tell a joke about a, a magician who invites an audience member. He says, I need someone from the audience kindly assist me with this. He, he's talking like the early 20, early 19th century or magicians, top hat and tails. And, and uh, this family thinks it'd be funny to get their grandmother to get up on stage. This little old lady gets up on stage and he says, madam. Kindly assist me with this trick. Please hit me on the head with this sledgehammer. And he hauls out a big 10 pound maul. And he takes his top hat off and he bends over and says, Oh, I couldn't possibly. I can't. I need. Madam, I am a professional magician. It is a trick. Please assist me. Hit me on the head with this sledgehammer. So, the, like, the stage crew helps her up and she cracks him on the back of the head with the, this 10 pound maul and he goes flat out on the floor and doesn't move. And it's funny at first, um, but then they, they roll him over and, and they see blood coming out of his ear and somebody screams and they, they get a doctor from the audience and he's got a little pen light and he shines them in the guy's eyes and his pupils won't dilate. And this is like really serious. They, Shows over, they call an ambulance and they bring the guy to the hospital. And the little old lady and her family, they go too, because she's terrified of what she did. Um, and in the morning, doctor comes out, he says, uh, I don't really have good news. I, uh, it's not as bad as it could be. He's gonna survive, but he's in a level three coma on the Glasgow scale. That's as bad as it gets. And if you wanna visit uh, and talk to him, he might hear you, we don't know. If it makes you feel, you're welcome anytime. So the little old lady visits the guy every day for um, a month, two months, three months. You know, finally, she's like, almost a year has gone by, and he's just lying there like this. And finally, uh, she sees his little finger move, and she calls the nurse, and they administer stimulants and stuff. And finally, after a year, the magician opens his eyes, and he looks across, and he sees the little old lady, and he goes, ta-da! <laughs> Now that story is a story that helps people. It's a joke, right? Yeah. But it's a joke about having faith and the magic of being alive mm -hmm. and survive. You know, I mean, it's, it's a joke, but it's a good story. And it's a, one of my favorite jokes. But you know, so, so you talk about stagecraft, think, like, you know, do I have time to tell the joke? You know, because would that just take three minutes? You know, if, I, if, I, if it's like, if you feel like you need to hurry up, then I, then I go to the other introduction. But I know people that are just, just pat, they sell, tell the exact mm. same introduction, mm. word for word every time. And I've learned, you know, I basically tell that joke the same way every time. I'll, I'll add mm. different details, but, um, so I don't worry about like what I'm gonna say. Yeah. And the best performers, you know, you, you can tell they're, they're just comfortable, they're just talking, yeah. Well, they appear to be anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, any other uh, comments or suggestions that you have for listeners or songwriters? Well, I do feel behooved to add that um, 
you know, we, we know each other from the open mic at Little Theaters. And, and my life is richer because I know you. Mm. And maybe your life is richer because you know me. Absolutely. And the only thing, the only reason we know each other is music. Uh, and I go to these things. Uh, there's a, uh, our, our friend Peter Curo has a group at the, at the Dreamway Lodge in, in the Beckett mm -hmm. in the summer. And that's the circle. It's not quite like an open mic, but you go around the circle, take your turns, and you share songs. And we get, to, we get together at Michael Orland's house on the third Friday, and we share songs. And the idea that people in a room sharing songs Donald Trump would not have any idea why anyone would ever do that. Mm. We live at a time where, uh, I mean, who do you remember uh, Kennedy would have giving concerts at the White House? Leonard Bernstein, Horowitz. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama had Esperanza Spaulding. I think he had Al Green. You know, he had the phenomenal. The White House yeah. traditionally would have concerts and and they would be command performances and very often televised. Uh, I remember seeing these, mm -hmm. and, we, and, and we haven't had one in, in three years. It, it, it means nothing. It, it, music means, just, it just doesn't mean anything to, certainly to Trump. I don't know about the people around him, but, mm -hmm. but maybe them too. I, I don't know. I just know that that it, there's a feeling I have like the people in power are trying to kill it. They're not funding the NEA, they're not funding public radio. Mm -hmm. They're trying to damage something that's important. And I'm trying to keep alive something that they're trying to damage, mm -hmm. and, and you are. And people who get together in circles to play music, uh, people who have house concerts, uh, are keeping alive something. And to me, it, it's, it's, it reminds me of the monks in the Middle Ages copying manuscripts by candlelight mm -hmm. in the dark. And they're keeping something alive that, that is almost dead, almost, almost gone. Uh, and, and I feel about that. I feel that about live music when I hear it, when I do it. Um, it's important. It's, you know, I, what was that Churchill? Somebody wanted to defund the arts and, and in favor of munitions during World War II. Mm, right. And, you know, the Churchill quote, if we did that, what are we fighting for? You know, mm -hmm. What are we living for if, if it's not to share a community and, sh and, and music, especially when a room full of strangers is singing the same song? You know, the chorus, you say, sing with me and, uh, you know, 30, 30 pretty much relative strangers all singing in one room is a sacred thing. It, there's, there's no, nobody's being mean to each other, nobody's worrying about their rent, nobody's greedy, nobody's selfish. Everybody is together doing a, a really cool thing. And, and, and that's what music has always meant, but it means more now. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like it means more now. Um, it's always been important, but now it's sacred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, um, not only did we get a great dose of your music, but also <laughs> some, some excellent insights into uh, what music is and how to make it. And uh, I want to thank you for well, sharing you. that with thank everyone. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching our show. I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Western Mass Songwriters Collaborative promoting the original music scene in Western Massachusetts. If you want to learn more about the collaborative, go to their Facebook page. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Dan. I hope you'll tune in again for the show that puts a spotlight on songwriters.